I uh, basically, uh, uh, I was born in Coronado district and uh, I studied at Malibu uh, College and grew up, I was there and then I uh, entered into Kalam University and I got obtained my first degree in uh, medicine and I graduated uh, in 1999. And uh, then I started uh, basically my career as a medical uh, practitioner. My internship at Mahanagara, then I got my first appointment at Colonna Rosso. Basically, that was my medical career, and I uh, that is my first appointment. I worked in an uh, intensive care unit. Uh, so, uh, at the same time, I got an opportunity to, you know, I was basically as an undergraduate also, I was you know, involved in teaching IT uh, because I got uh, qualified in IT with it, with British Computer Society examination. Before I entered the university, so then I got an opportunity to do lectures on uh, a part time basis. So I did this thing as a hobby uh, during my free time as an undergraduate, I did uh, lectures. So that ultimately you know, uh, gave me an opportunity with some other you know, partners to start up an uh, education uh, entity. Who are the partners that you uh, That was actually you know, the people whom I met. Uh, in the industry at that time, they were basically the you know friends who were uh, colleagues who were lecturing with me uh, in various other institutions when I went to uh, lecture. Are they still involved? No, they are not involved. So, yeah, actually, at a time in the initial stages, of course, the company was not doing very well. So we were we, we started in Kilwakana, so it was not a very good uh, you know location for higher studies. So first two years were very dull. And then they were actually engaged in other jobs as well. So uh, therefore, they lost the interest. And uh, basically, they offered me uh, the option of taking over the company. So then at that time, uh, I took over the company uh, after about two years of starting. So, what was the catalyst for your success? I think basically, uh, I was uh, very confident about uh, what I was doing because I was, uh, you know, I myself had um, a lot of experience uh, in the training industry, especially as a lecturer, I think I, I had uh, worked more than five, six years when I started the company. So therefore, I, I knew what I was doing. So that, that led to the, you know, kind of love. Because you have confidence that you'll see. Yeah, one one confidence. But I was not prepared to take any uh, risk. Okay. And, uh, out of the universities and the institutions that you're affiliated to, why did you choose this particular place? Uh, yeah, now when you're looking at a university, basically, <coughs> uh, uh, one thing that we have to see is whether the university uh, offers the range of products that we want to, uh, you know, uh, offer to Sri Lanka students. So one thing that we have looked at is whether they have the relevant faculties and uh, whether they offer those programs, what is in demand, or uh, what is needed uh, for Sri Lanka students. The second thing is that, uh, you know, their willingness to uh, basically uh, partner with the, uh, you know, college and offer their programs uh, in offshore uh, mode. Because some will, some universities are not really interested in that. So basically, even though we want to partner with them, they, they are, there is no cooperation or a willingness from their side. The other thing is the affordability. Because we have to look at uh, basically uh, the, the royalty fees that they charge, so that we can you know offer a course uh, here to match with uh, our current economic conditions. Right? Uh, so which is you know our, our programs are priced. Uh, at the level that you know, even the uh, lower middle class can uh, afford. Uh, a person who is with a salary also should be able to, you know, parents who are salary parents still should be able to, you know, pay for their higher education, uh, higher education of their children. So that's the pricing. Okay. Now, in offering foreign degrees, how do you ensure that quality is uh, maintained? Uh, actually, uh, one thing is that we, uh, when we are recruiting staff uh, members, we are particular. Uh, recruiting uh, you know, qualified people. So we have uh, people with uh, PhDs plus uh, postgraduate qualifications. And especially we, we are very particular uh, uh, with regard to their teaching cap capabilities. You know, some are qualified but not 
uh, very successful in delivering their knowledge. So we, we basically look into that aspect as well. And the other thing is that we are uh, working very closely with the universities uh, in, in staff development aspects. So we actually have, uh, you know, Which uh, London Metropolitan University and Princeton University. We are basically getting down their uh, experience, academics, and we are having, you know, knowledge exchange programs like training programs, short uh, programs conducted. And in future, we are looking for sending our staff uh, to. Uh, their department so that they can get an international exposure as well. Out of your staff, how many are PhDs? What percentage? Uh, percentage is uh, very difficult to do a percentage. How because, many staff do you have? Uh, academic staff, we have about 100 plus. And how many are PhDs? Uh, 5%. 100 plus, I said that you're not in Colombo. Yeah. Sure. Uh, throughout, I have 100 and, plus academic And 5% throughout that? Yeah, throughout that. But if you, if you look at the PhD percentage here, it will be around 10 to 12 percent. In this particular, in yeah, Kalamu. Kalamu. Yes. Right. And, uh, so, I'm sure in, on a foreign aspect as well as the local aspect, there are quality assurance benchmarks. So, apart from good faculty, apart from this faculty, how else do you ensure that? Uh, we have we are ISO certified uh, company, so our processes with regard to you know uh, uh, student recruitment and certain processes have been uh, certified with ISO certification, and then also we have an internal uh, uh, quality assurance uh, circle headed by the uh, academic uh, staff, and one of the most important thing is that we have basically separated our management uh, board and the academic board. Right. So, academic board is headed by the dean and their senior uh, the heads of faculties. So, which management, marketing, uh, like CEO and the manager, management board doesn't have any control over the results and the academic operation. That is happening independently, headed by the uh, dean. Right. So, then that is one way that we basically try to you know keep that uh, quality of programs, delivery, even the results. Right. We don't want uh, to manipulate the results uh, for, you know, from a business perspective. Who is the head of your quality assurance circle? Uh, it is Dr. Dina, who is the dean, uh, Dr. Dina Hera. Okay. So he is the, the dean. Uh, the okay. He is the dean for the entire? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't have a vice chancellor post yet. Okay. So, and uh, how many students are taking each intake? Yeah, we have actually students this is again? Uh, uh, throughout. Yeah, uh, throughout. Of course, we have an annual intake of about thirty thousand students, but that is not only not for the degrees. Okay. Right, we get a lot of uh, students for our short term program, or certificate courses and uh, diplomas. Okay. So I think that number is about uh, you know about twenty five thousand is uh, that number. Right, out of that thirty thousand, but then about uh, uh, five thousand. Uh, around four to five thousand students, we take uh, for undergraduate programs. Right, uh, that is starting maybe and sometime the directly time. the degree, okay. uh, or maybe starting uh, HND programs which are leading to uh, the degrees. Right. Now, what is the main advantage for a student to choose your campus over any other? Uh, one thing is that they, they uh, one one advantage is that they will meet good uh, you know uh, lecturers. Uh, this is including the national yeah. universities. Yeah, yeah. So they will be able to actually, uh, in terms of our, uh, our you know academic uh, capabilities. Sometimes you know maybe number of PhD holders may be less, but in terms of knowledge sharing wise, I think uh, because for private sector organization it should be there. So we are uh, uh, having very good uh, lecturers. One thing. The second thing is that they can uh, they can basically. Uh, uh, reach us uh, uh, from different locations, right? so they can start their qualifications uh, probably uh, in their own uh, hometown. It's a uh, maybe they may have to come for the final year. How many campuses do you have? Uh, actually, campus status we have now we have different uh, grades of branches. Like the highest level is called Metro Campus, and we have five or six Metro Campuses. 
right? Uh, then we have five uh, regional campuses, which are not, uh, you know, as high as a, a metro campus. But basically, they are they are offering uh, undergraduate or maybe sometimes HND programs, but not the full range. Then there are metro colleges, which are not uh, offering uh, basically. How many metro colleges? There are thirty-four, thirty-four metro colleges, but they don't do uh, degree programs. Highest level that they do will be uh, HNDs. What is your personal involvement with your students? Uh, I'm uh, actually when, I, when it comes to the students, I'm a lecturer. Right? Uh, so still I do uh, about probably for a week, uh, maybe uh, 25 hours of lectures per week. Okay. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> so you manage to your yeah, because I, I usually, you know, uh, I don't do any administrative work on uh, weekends, so most of my lectures are falling on weekends. Maybe just one or two sessions falling on weekends. What is your general uh, work in the hours you come to? Uh, I work from eight, uh, 8 to 5, normal working hours, but then sometimes uh, certain days, evening classes, extended hours are there. Uh, I would say now, for example, on these days, uh, uh, students have a lot of education options uh, when it comes to you know both the private sector and the state sector. But I think when they're choosing uh, you know higher education, they must look at uh, basically uh, they have to see what is the what are the opportunities that they have in these respective fields. Sometimes you know some people just uh, learn things without really uh, targeting you know. Why I'm learning this? Right? There, there's no, uh, for example, some people learn psychology, and I know that there is, uh, psychology can be used in any field, but you know they don't really, uh, really get the benefit out of it. They don't focus. On it. So why I'm, they're doing why they're yeah, why they are doing it? Uh, they should first understand. Otherwise, they will be basically uh, without knowing that if they start the uh, programs, uh, uh, then they don't know even what they're expecting. So they can't really achieve uh, what they want. And I, I think they should be looking at, you know, rather than looking at these conventional only, you know, new fields. There are a lot of new fields uh, emerging and you have to see, you know, how to align yourself with the national developments and national uh, policies and then you will be able to get better opportunities.